Vascular Neur uh, Neurology at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, Vascular Neurology, another fellowship at University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, and his residency uh, at, uh, in neurology at Medical College of Wisconsin Affiliated Hospital Neurology. And his medical degree is from University of Damascus School of Medicine. He is affiliated with all of the Southland Advocate Hospitals. So that's Advocate Christ, Advocate South South, and Advocate Trinity. And his, uh, he does speak a secondary language, Arabic. And his primary focus is neurointerventional surgery, vascular neurology, and neurology. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just so you know, they are very educated. Excellent. So they will ask good questions. Oh, that's great. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, I want to thank you know the Oakland Library for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you and kind of do more education about stroke, why it's important. Also, Kate Merzik, she's our stroke coordinator at uh, Christ Hospital. She's here today as well. Uh, so please ask her questions well, not just me. <laughs> and so we're going to be talking about time is brain, right? We keep hearing this why time is brain and why we have to be fast in creating a stroke. Mainly, we're talking about lack of blood flow stroke. And I believe you guys were talking about AFib yesterday and how AFib results in stroke. So, this is going to be a continuation of yesterday. So, I don't have any relevant financial disclosures for the talk. Um, my clinical expertise is cerebrovascular disease, brain aneurysms, AVMs, acute ischemic stroke, subarachnoid bleeds, carotid disease, moya moya, vascular anomalies, and also spinal cord vascular malformation. So this is kind of the disease processes that I treat. Um, stroke, why is stroke important? It's the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. And it's the major cause of disability among all US adults. Um, it's the second lead cause of death in the world that was as of 2012. Um, 7.4 million people, um, or 6.7 million people died of stroke in 2012 around the world. The projected number of strokes in the United States, if we look at 2002, that we had around 700,000 strokes, ischemic strokes mainly. And in 2025, the projected number is gonna be 1.2 million strokes, which, which is a huge number actually. Um, and that's why we're trying to do continuous education and try to fight stroke and reduce the overall numbers. Why is that important? Because a lot of young Americans right now are having stroke. It was mainly around 20% people aged 46 to 65 that jumped to 26%, uh, which is a high number. These are people who are working, people who are productive, and that's resulting in disability and people not able to go to work. So that's why it's very important. Um, the national US cost of stroke is really high. We spend around $45.5 billion each year on stroke care, right? $7.9 billion are spent on in hospital stays, um, 2.4 billion on outpatient office visits and rehab. And then we have $17.5 billion that are lost annually in lost wages because these, as I said, productive people are not able to go to work. It's a lot of money that's being lost. That's why the American Heart, the National Institute of Health is really investing a lot of money on fighting stroke and preventing the stroke, okay? Be fast. where does be fast come from, right? So the most important thing that we try to educate our communities is recognizing stroke, right? We have the patients that suddenly someone's lost their balance, they're not able to walk, they're wobbly, that is concerning for stroke. They can't see out of their eyes for vision or loss of vision, concerning facial droop, can't move their arms or legs, slurred speech or not able to talk or comprehend, these are all signs of stroke. So we don't wanna wait for patients to get better. Whenever you spot something like this, you call 911. The earlier patients come to hospitals, the better the outcomes, even if it's false alarms, it's better to be you know, safe, then sorry later on. So always call, even if the, you know, symptoms got better, this could be still what we call a transient ischemic attack or um, 
Yeah, or a stroke here. disappear. And here we got a call, right? Um, He's on call tonight. So oh, this could wait. Uh, okay, I'm going to give you this. You could just give them a call. Oh, it's the life of a physician, right? Never... That's this is not emergent, so um, sorry about that. And for people hearing online, sorry that you know. So time is brain. The earlier patients get to hospitals, the quicker the treatment, the better the outcome. On the right side, we see the number needed to treat. If a patient is treated within 120 minutes, treating one out of two patients will have better outcomes. So 50% of patients will do better. The longer we wait, the longer or the delay in care. If we jump to 210 minutes, we need to treat three patients for one patient to get better. If we wait for 360 minutes, which is three hours, we need to treat five patients. At eight hours, we need to treat eight patients. So that means we're not getting the best outcome. If you treat two patients, one does better. That's better than treating eight patients, one gets better, right? You need to treat the least amount of patients for them to get better. So the longer you wait, the longer the reperfusion, the longer the restoration of blood flow to the brain, the, the worsening the outcomes. So every 30 minutes delay after ED arrival leads to 8% increase in disability. We do have disability scores. It goes from zero to six. For you to have a good outcome, you have to be zero, one, two. Anything above two, you're not gonna do well. Meaning we want patients to be able to go back home, take care of themselves, stress themselves, be able to go back to their normal lifestyle. If we're not able to accomplish that, they're disabled, we fail, okay? So anytime anybody spots any sort of stroke symptoms that I spoke about, please call 911. So the previous slide was talking about when we do surgical management for stroke, meaning, meaning endovascular therapy, right? And we're going to show you videos very soon. But even when we only give thrombolytic therapy, meaning the TPA, which is thrombolysis, the benefits are time dependent, right? The guidelines, the American Heart Association guidelines recommend that patients receive their TPA within 60 minutes of arrival, which is what we call the door to needle. The studies that have been performed, you know, get with the guidelines that less than 30% of US patients get the TPA within 60 minutes, which there's delays for multiple reasons, getting images, being seen by ER doctors, but when quality improvement, improvement initiatives were implemented in hospitals, the stroke outcomes were better. So we could give TPA up to 4.5 hours from less known normal. But the earlier you get the TPA, the better your outcome. So if we give you the TPA or give the stroke patient TPA within 60 minutes, their outcome is going to be better than if they get it within 120 minutes. You know what I'm saying? So always we have to get treatment early on. And here's a, a study that actually looked at that. And they looked at pre-intervention and post-intervention. Post-intervention means they were pushing for patients to get the TPA within an hour and all cause mortality in household went down from nine from 10% to 8.25%. The discharge to home went up from 36 to 42%. Um, patients' ability to walk by themselves without help went from 42 to 45%. So this kind of gives us an indication that the faster the patients get to the hospital, the faster the TPA goes in, the better the outcome, the better the functional recovery. And that's all what really stroke is about, is preventing further disability. So time is brain, right? So what happens with delays? What happens when brain tissue suffers lack of blood flow? Each minute we lose 1.9 million neurons on average, right? That's 14 billion synapses, 12 kilometers of myelinated fibers. And each hour the patient is suffering lack of blood flow, the brain ages around four years because of lack and loss of neurons acutely, okay? So that's why time is brain, because each minute is lost, look, look how much we're losing in our brain tissue. This is not a joke, this is serious stuff. But there are some patients that may not suffer the same 
brain loss or neuron loss, right? So we have slow progressors and fast progressors. So the, the, the green line is a slow progressor. That means despite being delayed in treatment, they're not losing as much brain tissue as a fast progressor, right? So fast progressors lose around 4 million neurons per minute. So these patients, we have to try to get them even sooner. We don't know who is gonna be a fast progressor, but we're gonna deal with everyone as a fast progressor and prevent the loss of 4 million neurons in comparison to 1.8 million neurons, which is a lot. The average cell death is 1.9. If you're a fast progressor, you're losing double the amount of cells, which means your outcome is actually getting worse each minute where it was lost. And that's, you know, Kate in the ER, she's always pushing to get patients TPA quick. You know, we appreciate all what you do, Kate. Uh, there's always have to be people, you know, kind of watching and kind of keeping the timelines clear. Um, and so we call 911. The EMS accept the patient, patients in the ER, right? The ER gets pre-notified, okay, there's a stroke patient. So we kind of get things ready. We need to get imaging, right? We need to move brain imaging to identify what's the stroke, where is it? So we need to make sure the patient didn't have a brain bleed because once you have a brain bleed, that's a complete different pathway. We're talking about ischemic stroke, lack of blood flow stroke. We need to make sure it's there a large vessel occlusion. Is it a big stroke or a small stroke? And is there other tissue at risk of the stroke? And then our patients, candidates for endovascular therapy, is there a large vessel shut down in the brain that we're gonna have to go in with a catheter and pull the clot out of the brain, right? 30% of strokes are catheter um, therapy um, candidates, which, which is a lot, which almost 200,000 patients a year in North America. So how do we select patients or, or therapy in stroke, right? So th there's two things. We either want good studies, good imaging studies that will give us exactly the stroke volume, right? The, the more accurate the picture, the longer the time to get that picture with the current technology. So if you wanna get an MRI, which is the best test, you need 45 minutes to obtain it. And that's not good. If you're, if you're waiting for 45 minutes to get an image, a lot of brain tissue is gonna get lost. So if you want a fast test, you know, you want to get tests really quickly. It may not be as accurate, but you want some information to select patients for therapy. So what we do at Christ, you know, we do a CT head and a CTA and a CT perfusion, the first kind of couple tests, because you want to walk, do this fast. And these could be obtained within probably eight, eight to 10 minutes after the patient's in the scanner. Okay. We also have software to tell us while the patient's in the scanner that this patient has a large vessel occlusion. It's artificial intelligence. So we get notification, okay, there's a patient that has a large vessel occlusion. We get notified, we start mobilizing our teams, right? To go to the OR. So this is a simple test, a simple CT that we look at M1, M2, M3, all those kind of numbers. And this identifies if there is any sort of lack of blood flow, and we want the score to be around six to 10. The lower the, the, the scale, the larger the stroke, okay? So that's the C, what we call the CT or the aspect score, which we calculated. And here's the, um, the CTA, which identifies which vessels occluded. So on the very first one, we, uh, where, where the arrows are, that's where the vessels are occluded. These patients are candidate for catheter therapy where we go in and chase the clot. So here's the, the CT perfusion. The CT perfusion identifies the tissues at risk of further death. So where the, um, where those purple kind of, um, where it's marked purple, those are the, that's the area that at risk of further cell death or stroke, which is called the penumbra. And then you have the MRI. The MRI takes a lot of time, but it gives you really a good picture here. This is a picture of an MRI where you can see whatever that white lightning on the, this, um, the white lightning, that's the area of stroke. And that's considered a large stroke. Okay. So time is no brainer, but brain is not time. So not all brains react to time the same way. Some people are rapid progressors, 
they stroke out pretty quickly. Other patients may not suffer the core stroke as the, the which as the fast progressors, they're called the slow progressors. Here, this is a case of a 42 year old lady that had a sudden onset of left side weakness. It started at around 1540 on the day of admin. Her NIH stroke scale is 22. The stroke scale is a score that we used to identify the severity of stroke. It goes all the way from zero to 42. So 22 is, is pretty high. That means it's a, it's a pretty large stroke. We do an MRI at 1602, which is around probably 22 minutes later. And you can see that white kind of area, that that's the stroke. This is a huge stroke, unfortunately. And um, we don't like seeing this because once we see this, there's nothing we can do, okay? And on the, um, the, the picture on the uh, left side, there, there's basically a left, uh, a right carotid occlusion. So the carotid is out uh, completely and that's why she suffered this huge stroke. On the other hand, you know, we had a 63 year old lady that had AFib. Uh, she's on Pradaxa, you know, anticoagulation for AFib, but she did not fill it um, in the last three months. So she has not been taking her meds. She was found unresponsive. Um, her NIH stroke scale was 24, also a big stroke, but her last one well was 24 hours prior to admission. And despite being 24 hours um, out, uh, she, was, she went back home because we were able to open her vessel. Um, so here's the occlusion site when she came in and we were able to open the blood vessel and she, she went home. So always take your meds, don't miss your meds. So the concept of penumbra is fire, of course, this is a satellite picture from, you know, California, basically. And where the fire is, is what we call the, the core stroke. The red circle here where it says right wood, that's where the potentially the, the, the fire may expand to. So we want to limit the fire to that where the fire is. We don't want the fire to expand. So that's what penumbra is. We want whatever patient stroke, if we consider the, the fire area as the stroke, we don't want her, the patient to have a larger stroke or basically a larger area getting affected by the, the fire. So we try to shut it down there so it doesn't expand. Does that make sense? So when patients come in, even if they had a stroke and they have a large vessel that shut down, you wanna make sure that you save the tissue that's not affected yet. So you open the blood vessel and restore blood flow to the brain, okay? But the question is that if you do more imaging before you select patients for therapy, does that kind of result in better outcome? We really don't know. Studies suggest that. So th these are the trials, Mr. Clean, Revascat, Escape, Swift Prime, Extend IA. These are the trials that were published in 2015 that established that thrombectomy or taking the clot out of the brain will result in better patient outcome, right? And all these studies, you know, resulted in, in good outcomes, basically, which means that around 40% to 70% of patients went back home, which is modified rank and scale zero to two, right? And most of them just result, use CT and CTA, but the first study, the MR Queen only used CT, 33% of patients went home. Where you had a CT perfusion or a CTA, you know, the patients did better. You still, you, you were more careful in selecting patients for thrombectomy. So that means that you potentially had better outcomes with the patients you offered treatment. But that also means that you probably left some patients without treatment because they didn't meet criteria, right? So in these trials, number needed to treat. That means how many patients do I need to treat to result in better outcome? MR Queen was one in seven. So you treated seven patients, to have one go home and escape it was four and extend IA it was three, swift prime four. So most of the time, what it comes down to is you treat one in three patients. So 35, you have a 35% chance of helping the patient go back home if they have a big stroke, right? Whether in, when patients were coming to the hospital with heart attacks, you had to treat 50 patients to make one patient better. 
So this is really robust treatment for stroke. This is the most powerful treatment of medicine we have today. If you're treating three patients, one is going back home, there's nothing better than that. So th these are amazing numbers. That's why we try to take all patients that come in with large occlusion for a thrombectomy because they're going back home. You only need to treat three patients to get one home. For heart attacks, same thing, you have to treat 50. So it's, it's really amazing. Hermes is a database that took all the patients that underwent thrombectomy in those trials. And when, despite low core stroke, less than 70 cc's of stroke or more than 70 cc's, large core patients who underwent thrombectomy had better outcomes, meaning going home, right? And here's also for even patients who had core stroke more than 100 cc's, the patients who had endovascular therapy ended up doing better than the patients that did not get, okay? And that, that's kind of the next step is that, should we be taking patients who have large stroke with large vessel occlusion, the thrombectomy, and that, that those questions are being answered. So benefit of endovascular therapy in large core strokes. This is also from the Hermes um, collaborators patients who had a large stroke and went for thrombectomy did better. We could see more patients are ha had a modified rank and scale of zero to two, which means they were able to go back home and perform the pre-stroke pre activities that they were able to perform before the stroke. Once you're at a three, that means you need to walk with assistance. We don't consider that good outcome. You have to walk without assistance. We looked at patients who had aspect less than five, which is considered a large, large stroke. Patients who underwent, you know, retrospectively, we looked at the data and patients who had thrombectomy with a large core stroke and multiple uh, registries, they actually ended up doing better. This was a trial that was published in April in the New England Journal of Medicine, a couple months back, or maybe several months back, sorry. Endovascular therapy for acute stroke with a large skin occlusion. This was performed in Japan, and patients who underwent thrombectomy did better. More patients were able to go back home despite having a large stroke. There's a, actually a trial right now that will be, I think they may have actually finished it. It's called PESLA trial, it's a North American trial, and it will be presented next year. We'll see what that comes. So we're gonna talk about some cases, kind of interesting stuff to, to see. Um, case number one, we had a 66 year old man, really when he came to the hospital, he didn't know any of his past medical history. He was not able to talk, his right side was out, he couldn't move his right side. His last known well was eight hours prior to the ED presentation. His stroke scale was 17, a bit higher number, larger stroke. This is the CT perfusion. The red color is the stroke, is the stroke he, he has. The green area is the area at risk of further stroke and do not intervene ASAP. So we have around 60 cc's of volume that we could save. It's, it's a lot of volume. Here's the CTA, see where that red arrow is? That's where the clot is sitting. This is an intra-op picture. The red arrow, that's where the clot is. We're gonna go there and get that clot out. Here's an intra-op image. As we're navigating to the clot, you could see the wire, the microwire stopping at the clot. And then we have our catheter that's gonna go all the way up. You could see the catheter moving there, see that? And the catheter is basically touching the clot so we could take it out. So this is kind of stroke, right? We keep getting not notification uh, about what's happening. You know, we cover the whole Southland PSA, Trinity, South Sub, Advocate Christ, and all the hospitals in the area. So, so see where that red, um, where the red arrow is, that's where the clot is. Our catheter is getting up to the clot so we can take it out. Here's our catheter. We keep it there and we connect the catheter to vacuum. 
aspiration. So it will suck it, basically take it out. We usually keep the catheter in for a minute, connect it to a machine pump. See, that's where the clot, the tip of the catheter, and it's basically sucking the clot slowly. And we got it open. So it's, that, that's where the clot was. We took the clot out and we established blood flow to that part of the brain. See, so this is before, after. See where the, that red circle is? We don't see blood vessels here, correct? After we take the clot out, so that's the most important thing. You want to establish blood flow to the part of the brain so the tissue doesn't die. Get the oxygen, the nutrients. Okay. So that, that's good. That's what we want to see. And here's the clot in the machine. See that kind of black thing sitting? That's the clot that was, that clot is like one millimeter. It could kill a human being. Where do you see it? I don't see it. There it is. See? See that? Here? Oh, 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 okay. It's one millimeter clot. That clot is capable of killing a human being. Anytime you spot someone not acting right, they're, they're not able to walk, they lost their vision, they can't talk, you call 911. Otherwise, we won't get this. Is that like the president now? Yeah. <laughs> no. Which president? No, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> So, so on these drawings, you're showing that you go in there with a the catheter and actually remove the, the clot. Yes, that's exactly right. That's the way you treat this. Yes. And you keep an eye on it. You can watch it with an MRI at the same time. So we usually get the MRI later. The most important thing is getting the clot out. And then we worry about what happened. The most important thing is establishing reperfusion to the brain. How do you, how do you see it when you're doing it? How do you see so it? That, that's what I'm going to show you. So after I take the clot out, See, I know there's a clot sitting there. See, there's no blood flow. You can see lack of blood vessels where that red circle is. After I finish, I open up, I know that I established blood flow. Does that make sense? to know exactly where the blood vessels are supposed to be. So for us, our naked eye, right? We don't know that there's supposed to be blood vessels there, but that's the beauty of why you're a doctor. Because they know that they're supposed to be blood vessels. It's hard. This and is a tough case, symptoms, really. Yeah. And based on your symptoms, they know exactly where to look for that clot. So we navigate. We know where it is. We know that anatomy. We know normal blood vessels. We know that the blood vessels are missing. That's why we chase it. Does that make sense? It does. Do you, do you, do you see this? I do see this. This is all intra up. Okay. So we use fluoroscopy you know, and contrast, and we, we know where we're going. This is all surgical management of stroke, so we know what we're doing, yes. We better know what we're doing. He's looking at these images every step of the way. So he's, he's he does a little bit, he takes another image. He does a little bit more, takes another image. So he can see exactly what he's doing and knows what he's doing. And then doing. when I know the clot is out, it's out, all right? Pretty big. It is big, yeah. It, it looks big here because I, I have it magnified, but it's like you can barely see it. We'll, we'll see. We'll show you more pictures. What is the percentage of if there's more than one? We if there's more than one, we chase the other one. So is the image is like MRI or is it no? This is fluoroscopy. This is angiography. Fluoroscopy. Yeah. So it's like have, it's like having a, a a cardiac cath is how he does his procedure. The imaging that we do before that, we shoot dye into the brain. And we get just the vessel imaging, and it would show um, potentially that large vessel occlusion that he's talking about, or or show the clot or the lack of blood vessels. So we go so either we're looking at through the groin all the way up, we cross the heart to the neck all the way to the brain, or we could go from the radial artery too. All right. So we have our systems that you know we follow the blood vessels of the brain to make sure that we. Uh, so this is the suction. So there's a multiple ways we take the clot out. This is what's with suction, okay? There's other ways we could do that. So for this patient, he had a great recovery. He was able to talk within hours later, move the right side. It's amazing. Case number two, we had a 68-year-old lady. She has history of high blood pressure. She comes to the ER with slurred speech and not able to move her right side, basically plegic on the right side. Last known well, when she went to bed was 10 p.m. the night before. 
once you're more than four and a half hours out, you cannot get the blood clot busting medication, the TPA. Her NIH stroke scale was eight. We did a CT, we saw the left MCA was occluded and she had mismatch. So the purple area is what this, the stroke she already has. The green area is the area at risk of further stroke. We want to save the green area. The purple is gone already. It's fine. The green we have to save. If you take a fish outside the water and the fish dies, you put the fish back in the water, what happens? Does it live? It's no, after it said it would not live. I promise you that. Same thing with brain tissue. Once the brain tissue is dead. No, no, if, if the fish dies and you put the fish back into the water, it's not going to live, right? Here's the same idea. The purple is dead. We're not going to, we can't save that, but we can save the green. Studying the green is what's going to make the patient do better, not be disabled, right? Here's the CTA. Here's the CTA. If you look clearly at the CTA, there's a black spot here. That's a clot. It's in the neck. Sometimes we have clot in the neck all the way extending to the brain. This was one of those cases. So you have a clot in the neck and a clot in the brain. These are challenging cases. You have to clean the neck, get to the brain, clean the brain. Right? It's plumbing work, but we lose plumbing, but plumbing of blood vessels. Go ahead. Clot break loose and it's still a danger, but instead of being stuck there. Well, that's what happened here. Yeah. I find it. So that's exactly what we do. We chase it. Yes, we chase it. And that's what we did here. We had a chase for that plot is. I mean, does it very does it very often then just break apart on its own? So sometimes it does with, with the blood clots that medication, yes. And then symptoms resolve then if no damage is done? Or the if the damage is not done, patient will do better. But if there's damage done, the same thing I was talking about, the idea of the fish die. Yeah. You want to get the fish back to the water before it dies. So I guess I'm wondering if it's possible that there would be a small clot, and by the time they get to the hospital, they scan. It's dissolved. The clot may have dissolved. It's possible. We will know. We will know. Yes, we will know. Proof that it actually did happen. That's what we need the CTA. Yeah. Okay. Or we could do an MRI later. Was there any damage? That's exactly right. Sometimes it may break loose. Yes. So also, no what you're describing is a TIA. Correct. So what, you, what you could also be describing is a TIA or a mini stroke, where you know that clot busted off of either your carotid or was you know shot from your heart into your brain. It did a little bit of damage, but it didn't do enough damage that it stuck. And then you, your symptoms resolve. We may not see that on the MRI, but by virtue of where your symptoms were, um, we can tell you that you probably had a TIA. But we treat TIA just like we treat stroke. We want to know kind of what caused it. We want to know your risk factors so we can help you treat your risk factors. Because treating your risk, risk factors is what's going to prevent an actual stroke or prevent another stroke from occurring. So we, it's kind of a, a, you know, whether you have a stroke or you have an almost stroke as a TIA, we're going to treat it exactly the same. So who's the best type of professional to see following a TIA that results? In a, a vascular a stroke doctor, vascular neurologist, a stroke doctor. Okay, a vascular neurologist. Yes, or a stroke doctor, yeah. It's important, and that's why Kate's bringing up a very important point. You may have a clot that breaks loose and your symptoms resolve within an hour. Don't sit on it, you come to the hospital still. Because your risk of future stroke is pretty high within the first 48 hours after a TIA. So TIA, as Kate said, means stroke as well, even though you resolve from you. Okay, go ahead. Do all strokes result from a clot from the heart or can it come from another part of the body? Heart, neck, or from the brain itself, the arteries are diseased. So, and that's why when you come to the hospital, we try to, we do a workup to make sure where the clot came from. We look at the neck, we look at the heart, we look at the blood vessels of the brain to see what, what causes stroke and how to prevent it from happening in the future. You get a clot in your leg. Yeah. Not necessary, no. From, clot from the leg could be from, you know, arterial disease in your legs or something shot from the heart. And if it came from the heart, there's risk of it coming and causing a stroke too. So but here- We are cardiac patients, we become neural patients anyway. The problem is that anytime you have disease, in, a vessel's disease, it's one system, right? 
So if you have vessel disease in your neck, you probably have it in your leg, in your heart. You're exactly right. So if you do have ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease, you're at risk of stroke. And there are studies that prove that. So I think it, 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 it should be automatically people like uh, you mentioned, they should, they should send the patient after the cardiac any problem. Go anyway. Sure. Okay, I like that idea. Okay. What do you think? Stop that. <laughs> and, you know what? Because you're right, you're I, right. I'm a nurse and I know it in cardiac. We have so many uh, come there. And later on, I know some are the other. They get you're at high risk. You're exactly right. Yeah, but, but on the flip side of that, and I don't disagree with you. However, what I would say is that cardiology starts. For, you know, just like our guidelines for stroke, we, you know, treat high, uh, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, they do the same thing because they know that it's the same risk factors. So when you have a cardiac incident, they're pretty much trying to prevent heart disease and stroke. So it, it's kind of, you know, it kind of works two ways because it, you're, you're treating essentially both with a lot of the same medications for prevention of another event. Does that make sense? I, I, I noticed they don't see more kind of scope. They don't go that far as much as they look around the cardiac wall. And, and, and I think this damage is actually killing the whole family because once the patient comes home Absolutely. You're right. with the stroke, is killing the whole family. The heart, at least you know he's going to sit on one side and do something wherever he can. But the stroke is the one. It is. It's far more. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. You are one hundred percent correct on that. It's the leading cause of disability. It's costing our nation fifty it's billion dollars a year. That's a lot of money. See that 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 is my my it, parents and everybody had died with a stroke and all these things. So that's that's why my knowledge is always. Is it is it we are improving anything scope as much as we are improving the heart? We, we 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 are. I think you know. The, the National Institute of Health, you know, American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, it, it's a lot of work we're, we're putting in, you know. We still need to do a lot of work, you know, but uh, we need to prevent disability, you know. Right. It, it wasn't that long ago, too, that stroke was actually the third leading cause of death. Right. So, well, the good news is we've moved from the third to the fifth, right? Correct. So, So we've improved. Right. However, we still have the number one cause of adult disability. And that, you know, post stroke, and, and that's what you're referring to, you know, because that's what's that devastating. Is the one I'm, I'm sorry. Absolutely. Every time you go to the rehab, you know, you see the young generation with the stroke. And, Correct. And, and, and it's I, getting younger. And that's what it is getting it's younger. Getting younger. Unfortunately, in North America, the people that are productive, 45 to 65. Yep. What, what's your comments on the COVID heart associations for the younger? I mean, definitely what we know is that COVID-19 increased the prevalence of stroke in certain patient populations. It did. It did, yes, it did. And, you know, probably that's related to hypercoagulability, um, you know, that your blood is forming more clots and stuff like that. But what we need, the, the takeaway message is that we need to treat the risk factors. High blood pressure needs to be treated, high cholesterol, diabetes, you know, obesity, we have a lot of things that resulted in stroke before COVID-19 and they still exist after COVID-19. We have to attack that, okay? Yeah, and because of what she was saying, I'm sorry, but there's so many ads for all these different um, preventative tests. You go get all these heart type tests, Correct. battery tests, and there's all different companies, all the heart types. Are those legitimate or a good idea? Or is it just more of, I mean, I know it's not a waste of money, but. Is that a good thing to do when you've reached certain age? I know? think so. I really do. I think you know, you know, screening yourself for high cholesterol or diabetes, looking at your heart. I think that's that's important. Screening for atrial fibrillation, that doesn't definitely doesn't hurt. The more you know about your health, the more you can prevent future disasters from happening. Like yes. Those outside sources come in for you know, hundred dollars and get this, 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 this for your heart. That kind of thing. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. That's how. Never I mean, I think I don't know. I I, I can't. <laughs> Talk for a certain group, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot of people, like private people, that you know, private companies want to do that. You know, I, I don't think it's a bad idea. But I will always consult with their primary care doctor. I think that's their best bet. Okay. Going back to the case, so here, 
you know, this is basically a carotid occlusion. The artery, the major artery that feeds that the brain is shut down. And this is really scary. You could see this kind of thin line. That's not enough to give blood to your brain. So when we see this, we have to fix it emergently. This is a intra-op picture. See, there's the occlusion where the red arrow is. And then we have another occlusion in the brain. See that? So we have to take care of both. And here's a video animation of how sometimes we take a clot using a stent to pull the clot out. And here, let's take a look. So here's the clot. We cross it with the wire, and then we get a catheter across the clot. We take the wire out, and then we basically take our stent, we push it through the catheter, and deploy it across the promise so the stent will engage the clot and make sure it doesn't go further or doesn't um, see that. So the, the stent is engaging the clot right now. And that's what we, we did. So you see the catheter here where we perform suction. And then you have the stent here, which is going to engage the clot. So you, you suck the clot and pull together so you make sure that you pull the whole thing out and it doesn't break off. So you doesn't need... quite do it that aggressively, just to yes. just say. <laughs> I'm just so saying. I... It's not like that exactly. <laughs> I'm just trying to give it the momentum here. <laughs> yeah, we have to be really gentle. You're dealing with blood vessels of the brain. And here's how we pull it out. So you kind of drag it. And you can see how the stent is pulling the claw all the way outside the body. See that? And that's what you want to establish. You want to establish reperfusion to the brain. The clot is not allowing the blood to go past it. When you take it out, blood goes. Now, look at this illustration. Are you taking pictures as this as the stent is going in or yes. moving? Or is it just a one-shot thing and you hope No, I, I'm taking continuous pictures, but here, this is a one-shot picture. Yeah. But I, I always, I have two cameras basically, and I'm looking at both planes together while I'm moving, for sure. We is, can't, this, is, this taking, is this taking still pictures or just like a video? It's basically angiography. And so every, it, so I'm taking basically 7.5 pictures a second while I'm doing this. Still pictures a second. Yeah, 7.5, which is almost like a video. Right, exactly. Yeah, 7.5 pictures a second. That's almost like a video. You can that's faster. why you're doing it. Yeah. You're actually taking the pictures as you're doing as it. As I'm doing it. I cannot do anything. I have to see everything I'm you doing. You have to see it. Yeah, because I need to know where the vessel is. I don't want to go through the vessel and injure a vessel. Right, right. Exactly, 100%. A good, very good question. And even when I'm pulling out, I'm taking pictures still. Does the clot break a lot when you? Do Sometimes it? it does, and we don't like that when it happens because when the clot goes too distal, it becomes dangerous because I have to go really further and the vessels become small. So it doesn't happen a lot. We don't like it when it happens. Which is why you use the stem thing to kind of grab the whole thing at once. That's exactly not just at one end. You're actually grabbing the whole thing in the middle. Correct. And then I'm actually using suction too, so I'm using two forces. Oh, okay. Now, so this is how it looks like after I take it out from the body. It still looks pretty big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like you can, so this is the tip of my finger here, right? Yeah. It's pretty small, but this is a, a really magnified picture. So this is essentially like a clogged artery. That's what a clot is. It breaks free from the clogged artery. Correct. Yeah. Now, so, these, these, tell me about this clot thing. Is this something that grows over time or does it just happen overnight? It happens at the second that you, you may have a plaque in the neck. That, that could be there for a long time. It could be, but like what happens that for whatever reason, something breaks off your neck and just goes to the front. Yeah. So, it, and it happens at that moment, the moment you have symptoms. That's why it's called the stroke, because it happens at that second. But the, the plaque itself can yes. be 
uh, from a minute to an hour to, to weeks to, to years, years that have been right. developing. So it, it, it you just don't know because we're not constantly looking at your vessels. You don't know if it's sitting there unless you have diseased vessels that you already know about. But it, it can happen in a heartbeat or it can happen over time. Yeah. But the moment the clock goes to the brain, that's right away. That's, that's boom. That's the stroke. Yeah. That's, that's when stroke. it hits that vessel. Right. All right. So we can all be having these little things growing in our blood vessels right now. That's exactly right. So that's why the blood pressure has to be under control, your cholesterol, your diabetes, smoking. It's a continuous process. We commonly kind of use um, our vessels and we compare it to plumbing. You know, yeah. your plumbing in your house that's been there for 30, 40 years. I've lived in Oklahoma until just recently for my entire life. So, you know, not done, I've not changed out of my, my piping in my house. So over time, we know that it's it's getting clogged and um, that hole, that vessel or that pipe is getting a little bit clogged with calcification and all the things that go in there. Yeah. Same thing as a vessel. Yeah, but when my totally clogs, I don't die. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Go ahead, sir. Uh, trauma slash pain if you hit a, uh, a bad injury. This uh, uh, can this fall into uh, some of the uh, some of the. Uh, I don't think like, stroke doesn't usually cause pain. So, um, like you know, if I had like a like a muscle a tendon that got ripped apart, the trauma from it would that. Uh, I don't think so. Really, because so afterwards I wound up getting like they're saying it's like vertigo. Yeah, I think what what we worry about if, if you had injury to your neck. There's something called dissection. If you have rapid neck manipulations or you go to a chiropractor and he snaps your neck, there's a, a small possibility that he may injure one of the artery that's hitting the brain and cause a stroke. But that doesn't hide itself. You'll have symptoms immediately. We see this. So be careful when you go to the chiropractor. Don't let them snap your neck. It happens after that often? It happens. We see it a lot. Because we're, we're a comprehensive stroke center, we see a lot of post-chiropractor artery injury. When I used to be in Cleveland, actually, you know, we weren't too far away from Cedar Point, the roller coaster mm. uh, theme park. We used to get patients actually from Cedar Point that had dissections after being in a roller coaster. So young people. Young people. Yeah. Is that different from when people wow. they do this yeah. to themselves and they take their snaps? Yeah, don't Is snap your neck, thing? please. Is that the same thing? It's the same thing. Don't snap your neck. I see like a lot of young people doing that. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> Don't yeah. snap your neck, please. <laughs> Repeat it one more time. I don't want anybody to snap it for you either. <laughs> so, so here's the vessel after we opened it. See that? That's where the clot was. So before, after, before. And the only way to sometimes know is to look before and after to real recognize what's going on. And here with the carotid. On the left side, you can see how the carotid was shut down, and we ended up putting a stent to keep it open, and you can see how the RA beautiful looks like after establishing reperfusion. Okay. So the purple was the stroke. The green is what we would have saved, and the MRI showed that we saved the green spot. So whatever is lightening up on the MRI on the right side matches the purple. That's what we want. We want to keep the stroke small and save the resultant brain tissue. Okay. So we were able to help this lady. She had a complete recovery. She went up home. We saw her in clinic in two week follow up and she was doing very well. All right. So even though they had part of the brain gone, you still okay. Yeah. That's the whole idea. We want to keep the stroke as small as possible. So your 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 brain will take over that area and go back to normal. If the stroke is too big, you don't have extra tissue to take over. Go ahead, Kate. Did she have any symptoms? She might have had some symptoms going home. She might not have completely resolved her symptoms, but we minimized her from having worse symptoms by being disabled. That yeah. So if you have just your hand is numb, that's that's completely but acceptable. But it could get better over time. It, it could, could get yes. better over time, absolutely. That's acceptable. Absolutely. So this was two weeks. The first measure that we like to do after stroke is at 90 days. So if she was doing better at two weeks, that means she'll even do better at 90 days. And usually after you stop getting better at one year from your stroke, after one year, that's where you plateau. That's it. Yeah. But I will, so I'm going to 
<laughs> so I would add on to that. You you probably aren't going to get much better, but the nice thing is you learn new pathways in the brain of how to do things different. So you may not necessarily improve, but you'll continue to improve by learning new ways of doing things. So, you know, it, it, you may not be able to necessarily use your right hand or your left hand, um, but over time, you learn how to reroute some of that mm -hmm. and you can still learn new techniques to be able to use things. Because all those other parts of the brain were safe. Correct. Correct. And, and that's, is that neuroplasticity? Correct. And that that the, very good. So that's what the National Institute of Health and Neurological Disorders in right now. We know that we have to open the blood vessel quick, right? But what if we don't? So right now the research is on how to help the brain tissue that's dead to regenerate and basically build newer connections. That's the new frontier in stroke right now is neuroplasticity, okay? Fixing the bad parts. That's exactly what we're putting right now microchips in the brains, you know, but it's, it's very interesting what's happening right now. Case number three, 83 year old lady has history of heart failure. She has atrial fibrillation as well. She's on Xarelto, a lot of other risk factors, such as hypertension, high cholesterol. She was found unresponsive on the couch by her family in the morning. She was last known well at 10 30 p.m. That's when she spoke to her daughter. We could not give her TBA because she's on Xeralto. And she was out of the window more than four and a half hours. In the ED, she was unresponsive, and we had to put an airway in her because she, she could not really breathe that well. This is the CT. So looking at that CT, you could tell that there's asymmetry between both sides of the brain, right? You can see there's a darker part of the brain on the Right side, that means that's struck down. Yeah, go ahead. This area. So see that area looks different than the area on the, the left, right? You can see that if you look at it carefully. That 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 area already struck down. We don't like seeing that. The purple is the stroke. It's 163 cc's of stroke. Once you're above 120 cc's, we really can't help. We don't like seeing this. That means it's a large stroke. And we look here, you see there on the left side, on the right side, or you can see vessels on the other side, you don't see. There's complete asymmetry. That's a day later. It's a very bad looking CT. Huge stroke. The patient did not have a good recovery. So this person did not pass away, but they had a, they had a lot of problems. That's right. A lot of problems. Better than this. What are the future frontiers for stroke treatments? Sometimes when the, the arteries are calcified in the brain, they don't respond well to treatment. We still don't know what to do with that. Do we stent them? Do we put blood thinners? We really don't know. So that's something we have to, to answer. Large core strokes. Should we perform therapy in all of these? We don't know. If the vessels, as you asked, if the clot is distal, some people are saying we should chase every clot, no matter where it is. We still don't know if that's the right thing to do or not, okay? If the patient has a large vessel occlusion, but their stroke symptoms are mild, are they gonna get worse or not? We don't know. Should we treat them and fear if they're gonna get worse? We're still studying that. There's newer meds coming out, newer thrombolytics, you know? They're potent, they're able to dissolve a lot of clots. Is that better than going with a catheter? We don't know. What we know is catheter therapy works pretty well. Okay, so there, there's a lot of still neuroplasticity is another frontier. So there's a lot of things that we have to do to, to improve stroke care. We did a lot, but there's still a lot to do. Go ahead. Does every patient's information about the surgery go back as an evac to uh, as like a database? Yes, that's you, our each get, and every one. Yes, so that's our get with the guidelines database. So every stroke that we have at Christ Hospital goes into this get with the guidelines database, which is um based out of american heart american stroke association and they do large studies and low large cohorts and look at you know um, combining data nationwide worldwide so that we can learn how to better improve and we look at our timelines and we look at you know if something happened if you come to christ as a stroke patient and you get either the thrombolytic drug or the intervention we break down that case and say, what could we have done better? What should we have done better? 
exactly. so we can continually improve our stroke care because we want to make that difference every time for every patient. Got to get to us. What about if you have atrial fib and you're on Eliquist or Cervelto and you're saying you come to the emergency room and you can't have TPA because you're on, so then what? Then you go to catheter therapy. Oh, so if you have a large vessel, if you do, yes. Oh, okay. So yeah. even the, you're taking Zeralto and, you know, Abixaban or all those drugs, your risk of stroke is going to go pretty low, okay. but it's not zero. Okay. So if you come in, you can't give you TPA and have a large vessel occlusion, you're still going to get treated. You get the trauma. That is right. Oh, okay. So I, the way we said it, in the first, like I thought, oh my God, there's nothing you can do that. Oh, okay. You think the basic starting point for stroke symptoms at um, Palos Hospital or Christ Hospital would be pretty much the same protocol with how they would handle it. Yes. And then if you go 911 or ambulance versus being brought in by a person, does that affect how fast they time see you? Absolutely. I would call 911. Absolutely. 911 is by far the way to go. They will notify us ahead of time. They will activate the stroke team. We activate the stroke team from the ambulance call. So I'm down in that emergency room where my stroke coordinators are down in that emergency room waiting for the patient saying, let's go, we gotta go to CT, let's do this, we gotta do that. So um, if you go in through triage, if somebody drives you, you gotta see the person at the front desk, then you gotta see the triage nurse, then you get registered. And, and even though they may call that stroke alert very quickly down in the emergency room, we've lost a lot more time. Yeah. So, so time is brain 911. So I have a current serious predicament is why I'm here. In 2020, Thanksgiving, right at the start of all this COVID sure. stuff, my husband had where he had a, a droopy jaw. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it or know anything about it. He noticed it and told me later it was just for a little while and then it stopped and he was okay. And we decided, oh, that we should get it checked out. Correct. But I drove him because of the neighbors and there's been some issues with the ambulance service and whatever. I don't know. We thought that'd be best that I could just get on there right away. And we went to Palos because Christ is always overwhelmed. But with the COVID stuff, they wouldn't let me come in. They wouldn't see him right away. They're just sitting in there. And I, and I tried to talk to security and they threatened me that they would call the police. You gotta go outside. And, and call so, mine, please. so it took forever before they even would bring him in. And so bring it to current, it seems like he seems to have He's having some neurological stuff, and I'm just trying to find out. He never did follow up. They said follow up with a general or a cardiologist or a neurologist, whatever you want, basically. They told him. I didn't get to talk to them. He didn't remember a lot. Sure. So that's why I asked you what kind of follow up. They told him he had a TIA. The symptoms were gone by the time he went in, but they didn't have any documentation on formal anything. Where was Neither that? one of us had no payloads. Neither one of us even knows what went on and what scans or what they did to, to you know, so, And so currently I'm in a predicament because I don't know how to communicate with him about who we should see. Okay, so why don't we do this soon? Uh, so let's give her the card. We're not, this is not, I just wanna make it clear. This is not advertisement. We're here today to deliver a message. The message is, Stroke 911. Anything that doesn't feel right, all those deep fast symptoms that we spoke about, even if they get better, you call 911. That's, yeah, that's all so I'm going to say. It was a short term thing. thing. Nobody saw it except him. I would still seconds. have it evaluated. And then, and then it went away. Yeah. So you would still call 911. I, I would. I would. It's like, I'm fine now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that would still be taken. And they, they will, they, when EMS comes, they have their assessments as well. They know what to do. Yeah. Okay. Do you have I'll a question? I'll talk to you a little bit after. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. You're talking about these meds now. Do they have meds that can that can dissolve the clot? Yes. So we have medications that you know we have PPA, which the people have been using it in North America since 1995 to, to dissolve clots. But depending on the clot characteristics, these blood thinners cannot bust the clot all the time. So you could still get PPA and the clot is still there because it's big. So that's why you have, if you have a large vessel occlusion, we give you TPA still and take you for the thrombectomy to take the clot out. Right now, next week, we're going to start a newer drug called PNK, which is also a blood thinner, maybe a little bit more potent than TPA that we're going to give our patients. 
if they come in with, with stroke symptoms. And there's people working on other drugs that are even more potent than TNK, but they have not made it to the, the clinical practice yet. Okay. I have one stupid question, but I'm going to ask. Okay. If person comes in ER with TIA for three times, okay, did not get the stroke. So they do they send it the patients to you to follow up? Well, I mean, I, I, I am a stroke doctor by training, but they should, I think. So just every time they come here, okay, it was just TIA and as an observation, go home. TIA observation, go home, you know. But they're not going further one more step to see, you know. Sure, I mean the reason, the prevention here. Yeah, three times. I mean, uh, but that's Part of that is the medication and, and trying to do some uh, modifications of your lifestyle, you know, to try and prevent that stroke from happening. You know, it's happening, so we know you're at risk, but the best thing we can do is treat those risk factors. Um, sometimes it's just a, you know, it, it, we can't do, sometimes there's just nothing that can be done, unfortunately, um, except trying, trying each time to tweak something a little here, a little there that might um, decrease your risk. The family doc said, for the rest of your life, take the low dose That's aspirin. That sounds right. There's something on the radio about that they're changing that protocol now. You know? What is it? There was something on the radio about they're changing that protocol now that that's not, they're not recommending that anymore. I don't know. That, that could that. be for other things, but not necessarily for stroke. Yeah. I've not, not heard that for heart attack is recommended for colon. There's a lot of there's a lot of blood thinners that we can use for stroke. Okay. Aspirin is one of them for sure. All right. All right. Well, can you go back to be fast? Your be fast slide sure. at the very beginning. This is the most important thing you have to take. This out is what tonight. I want you to walk away with tonight. <laughs> and if somebody has to teach you, Dr. Ross is going to take a clot. It's not yeah. about Dr. Ross taking a clot out of your brain. It's recognizing the symptoms. Whether you recognize it for yourself or for somebody else, recognizing those symptoms is truly, truly key to um, uh, stroke and, and recognizing it and getting to the hospital. So um, yeah. that's one thing. You wanted to ask a question. So I wanted to add a couple of things. I, I kind of took a couple notes while he was talking. And you should be teaching your grandkids and your children how to recognize stress. Because they are the ones who might be around. So we, we talked a lot about 911 being critical. So I'm not going to talk about that one again. 80% of strokes are preventable. And they're preventable because we know and treat our risk factors. So that high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, the fact that we're treating them, diet, exercise, is really, really critical to preventing a stroke. All right, so um, I know we, we teach take your meds and all of that kind of stuff, but it, it's, a, it's a little bit more sometimes than that. So I'm a little overweight. I need to be losing weight. Thankfully, I don't have high blood pressure or high cholesterol yet, but I do have a risk just by being overweight. You know, So knowing and treating those risk factors is really, really key. And knowing what those risk factors are. So talking to your doctor about what puts you at risk for stroke high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, um, things we can't do anything about. Some things are modifiable. Things we can't change are our age. Um, stroke over the age of 55 is most prevalent and it increases as we get older. Um, there's your stroke alert. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, as we age, we, we increase. African-Americans are a higher risk for stroke than Caucasians. So we wanna make sure that we're knowing what our risk factors are changing what we can change, but there are some things that we can't change. I wanna go back to be fast. Truly, 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 um, this is what's critical. This is what you need to walk away with, these symptoms. Um, and and we, we teach balance. Are you able to walk? Are you off balance? Are you slumping to one side? Um, eyes, the vision, is it blurred? Is it double? Have you lost vision? I've heard of a lot of people who've lost like part of their vision and they can't necessarily see part of their vision. Where do you go? They go to an eye doctor. Eye doctor says you need to go to the emergency room. Why? Because it's that back part of the brain that 
um, where you've had potentially had your stroke that's caused the vision change. So, you know, sometimes having to be able to, you know, differentiate, not always easy, but certainly um, face that facial droop. You noticed facial droop or your husband noticed facial droop. Um, that's one of the early, you know, more prevalent signs. Somebody's face drooping where it just doesn't go up like the other side. Um, you ask them to smile and one side goes up and the other side doesn't. Arms, asking, especially if you have suspicion, asking them to hold their arms out. If they can't lift one arm or it drifts down like that where they just can't hold it up on their own, that's a critical sign. Speech, asking them to talk. I think your uh, Jeopardy slide was supposed to be speech. <laughs> I caught that. We didn't talk about it, but I caught it. So, you know, asking somebody to say a sentence, it can be any sentence. Um, say the, the weather in Chicago stinks today. <laughs> you know, um, it, say uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. If they can say that sentence with no problem, um, but sometimes they seem confused or they can't get the words out or they can't repeat, um, those are often signs and symptoms. Now, we know that people being intoxicated, we know that there's other things that can mimic stroke, but you just don't want to take the chance when it comes to stroke because you don't want to be that person that ends up disabled, not able to talk, not able to move an arm because you, you, talk, you talk the symptoms away. Oh, my arm doesn't feel right this morning. You know, oh, I must have slept wrong on it. Well, did you sleep wrong on it or, or is it possibly a stroke? So you really want to take signs and symptoms very seriously. And T, most important, time, call 911. Another T is terrible headache. So we've talked about clotting type of strokes, but there is a bleeding type of stroke also um, where the blood vessel actually ruptures and bleeding into the brain. And one of the signs for um, a bleeding type of stroke is terrible headache. So while most strokes don't cause pain, headache, it doesn't cause pain in your arm, but if you had a terrible headache being the worst headache of your life or something like that, you do want to think of potentially a bleed. And, and this is a complete too. separate talk, you know? Yeah, that's a whole, yeah, yeah, that's, we talked about ischemic stroke, but I just wanted to throw that in. No, for sure, fixed it. And then if that terrible headache goes away? Or so, will it just keep getting worse till you just, you know, you gotta go see somebody? It's hard. I mean, the headaches are, are probably, and that's why he said it's a, it's a whole nother lecture because they are probably one of the hardest things because they can, it can be a, a slow, yeah. slow, it can be you know magnified. But if you have a headache that starts that fast and that like, oh. Thunderclap headache, like lightning hit your head, somebody banged your head with, with a hammer. That's somebody. That's that, not going to get better, believe me. Yeah. So that's the one you want to go to the hospital. Okay. All right. That's all I wanted to say about Thank that. you so much. I know it's probably a lot of information, a lot of- Thank you very much. I mean, I think maybe we should probably plan for the future as Kate's saying for a bleeding stroke talk. You know, maybe that will find out with soon in the future with the Oakland leadership. Uh, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. This is very important. You know, we're trying, you know, Kate, you know, even in the hospital itself, we're trying to deliver this message, you know, stroke, disability, it's a lot of burden. And two more things, just real quick, on all those little things. So with the history of TIA especially, if you get um, just one or more of those here, just little little bits of them, a little here, a little there, whatever, they could be more mini TIAs, I know that. Would that show up if there were little minis over a long period of time? Would those show up on any kind of scan if, if a person went in to, to have that checked out? Would any kind of a scan or what would be the best one? That might show MRI yes, you've got a series of many MRI. an MRI, and, and it's likely that that might show multiple of those, right? Better than a scan. Yes. And the other thing is that I've got this card that looks like it's from 2010, where it used to be um, act fast. Yep. Um, the stroke, whatever. Have they upgraded, updated these? They're available somewhere, these cards to be to yes. be fast. Okay. All right, thank you. My brother has been taking Coumadin for a long time. Is there any better medicine than the Coumadin? Coumadin works pretty good for atrial fibrillation and related stroke deaths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, what is the other medicine that I There's use? Eliquis, oh, which is Abixaban. It carries a lower risk of brain bleeds than Coumadin. You also have 
Ernexa, Zeralto. There, there's a bunch of meds, yeah. So he, he could consult with his you know, primary care cardiologist to see what works the best for him. All right. Thank you. 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 Thank